Do you think that property damage or even physical violence justifies the end? And actually, do you see property damage as violence even? I don't see property damage as violence. I've always been very selective in what I choose to attack. I don't attack mom and pop stores. I don't attack small businesses. Do I believe that violence justifies the means? Um, yes. Do you see peaceful protest as degrading since we as citizens have the power to take it to the streets and induce greater measures? Asking for permission is kind of like the Jewish people asking the Nazi regime to protest. I'm going to go into the streets whenever I feel the need to go into the streets. Being an anti-fascist activist, about 90% of your work, no one ever hears about and no one really cares about, right? Because it's not the sexy violence that people care about, right? Most of my activism is spent passing out food, giving out money. With the election of Trump, you know, the right wing is feeling comfortable reaching out to me and threatening me. And um, in 2020, I was shot at twice. Like I said, in 2018, my house was firebombed. What's your main way of fighting for your cause? I fight fascism. In, like, in what way? I don't like when fascists come to my town. I, I will fight a fascist in the street. You know, if a, fascist wants, if a fascist wants to get down, we can get down. You know, I have a hanging Klansman on my arm for a reason. See, I don't believe people like Donald Trump and Elon Musk, I don't believe they're capitalists. Capitalism is pro-illegal immigration. Then you don't have to pay them what you have to pay a worker. So in the end, you're making more money. Every time I have had to use violence... I go around the corner and I cry for like 45 minutes. I hate violence. It's like, I'm pretty good at it, but I don't like it. I don't do this because I like it. You see it as a moral obligation on your part. Yeah. So what I want to say is... Uh, you still consider yourself the uh, member of Antifa, right? Or like a former member? Or how would you categorize yourself? I am anti-fascist, yes. What does Antifa stand for? Is it, um, okay, so you said anti-fascist. What else? Anti-fascist means freedom. It means anti-authoritarianism. It means that people have the right to live their lives how they see fit so long as they are not harming any individual. Is it, is it um, like anti-communism as well? It is anti-communism. Um, the Iron Front, it stands for no communism, no fascism, and no monarchy. Because I, uh, because as I was looking at the uh, logo, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to be made out of two flags. And I think one is representing anarchism and the other one communism. There, there are different flags. Communism is authoritarianism. Myself... I am not pro-communist, right? I don't want something or a political system that has gulags or re-education camps. That doesn't sound like freedom to me. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'm not a fan of gulags either. Uh, I've heard some uh, uh, Antifa members saying they are pro-communism, though. So would you label those as not really members of Antifa, but like uh, maybe they're misguided into where they actually are? Anti-fascism isn't an organized group so there are many groups and and there may be groups that are communists and call themselves anti-fascist right um that's not me it's um not my friends right it's not it's not the people i surround myself with anti-fascism is very independent it's kind of like you have religion let's say you have christianity and then you have extremists in a religion who misunderstand the whole concept anyway or like a certain i don't know a, a certain movement has like extremists on each side and those are kind of people who categorize themselves as people who believe in in whatever that group preaches but they kind of are misguided in the sense that they kind of take it too far I mean, I, I hear you. I don't like to use the word extremism um, because anti-fascists all fight for human rights, for, for, for human liberties. And that in itself is not extreme. Do some people want to call themselves anti-fascists and communists? 
yeah if if uh, because i'm saying like if antifa is anti-fascism and anti-authoritarianism um, and like pro-freedom um i would say that it's <laughs> either i'm extremely lucky to be surrounded with only people with common sense or like 80 percent of people are anti-fascist so are most people inactive anti-fascist you know what i mean or or what makes you an, an anti-fascist because it's like I, I guess if i would like interview 100 people now i think at least 80 percent would say they're pro-freedom no one would say i i love authoritarianism assuming i'm not doing my interview in russia no no or, or i mean but here in the states it, it that is the case right you have a whole bunch of people here that say they believe in freedom but just voted for authoritarianism, right? So you do have that weird dichotomy in, in humanity, right? These people that call themselves anti-fascists and communists believe, weirdly enough to me, that communism was a good political system and that we haven't had true communism yet, whatever that means, right? So that's why they subscribe to their belief. Like, does I do I think that it's ridiculous just like I think religion is ridiculous? Yes. I mean, let's not get it twisted. It's not like any place in the Western world is in fear of becoming communism, becoming communist, right? Like like there may be communists in like every country in the West, but not no country in the West is in fear of becoming a communist nation. Actually, uh, I agree. Uh, and, and I think what you just point out here is that sometimes people's words don't really match up with their actions. And uh, I agree that if we if we just ask people, do you do you prefer freedom? They would say yes. But if you look at their actions, not necessarily the voting thing, but maybe their actions are even subconscious. Maybe they don't know what they're doing that is anti-freedom. Cannot really think anything out of my head at the moment because I'm actually sleep deprived. But OK, let's talk about your mission and what you are trying to achieve. Um what would be, I guess, how would a system look like society-wise and government-wise um, if Antifa actually achieved their mission? What would this, how would the structure be, I guess? Because I know that some of Antifa members are trying to demolish uh, institutions and some of them are trying to kind of like restructure it. Where do you stand here? Is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Starting therapy can be hard. The right therapist for you may not be in your area. BetterHelp is now sponsoring this podcast. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who is trained to listen and give you helpful, unbiased advice. With BetterHelp, you can have your therapy session as a phone call, as a video chat, or even via messaging if you prefer that. If you think you might benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash captainese. Clicking that link helps you support this channel and it also gives you a 10% off your first month of BetterHelp so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. Again, go to betterhelp.com slash captainese. Clicking that link gives you 10% off your first month of therapy. First problem is that we're talking about Antifa or we're trying to talk about them as, as as this group that exists. And while they do exist, there is there a bunch of little groups, right? So and they're all independent. So everybody I'm assuming has different motives and a different vision. My personal vision is to live in a place that is free education, free health care, free housing, basic human rights. So you have more of a holistic approach. So you're not necessarily anti, anti-economic anti structure like capitalism. I believe that I live in a period of unchecked corporate capitalism, right? And I think that's horrible, okay? I think that capitalism unchecked is, is an evil. I believe that we should have constraints on capitalism, but I do believe in a free market, yes. Unchecked capitalism and fascism you see as one and the same. 
Do you think they're the same system, basically, if we have unchecked capitalism? I mean, we can look at history and see that big business and fascism go hand in hand, right? We can look at Germany and see all the businesses that help prop up the Nazi regime and, and keep it going. So, yes, I, I, I absolutely believe that corporations and fascism have a similar goal. Okay. What would you incorporate into capitalism to make it to make it like checked capitalism? You know what I mean? The capitalistic system that you would say, okay, that's good. Because it obviously, so you are pro-free market, I am as well. Also, capitalistic system is, <laughs> so far has been the most peaceful one in a sense that capitalistic countries go to war the least. Because now, who cares about the reason behind that? The reason may be just pure profit, but war is actually pretty expensive. Um, <laughs> so there are things that capitalism has it going for it to make it cheap. Wait, I would disagree there with a statement that you said that capitalist countries are the least to go to war. Um my country has done nothing but go to war. My country, I mean, we can look at the Middle East and see that the problems in the Middle East are due to capitalism, right? We've brought that region nothing but guns and weapons and Starbucks and McDonald's. We haven't brought them water and education and housing and the good things, right? We've done nothing but prop up wars so we can finance our lifestyle. But, it, but but is it due to capitalism or it or is it due to the like the international policy of United States that just likes to expand its ego more than anything else? You know what I mean? It's due to greed. Capitalist a capitalist society is a greedy society. You're taught that you can take whatever you want, however you want it, and you can just take it. That's greed, right? So. We have these companies that are like, well, we sell more weapons, we make more money. You know, who cares how many people die, right? So I w and I would even argue that World War II brought my country out of the Great Depression, right? World War II put people to work. World War II made made weapons. World War II made money. So you're looking at uh, I'm trying to pick from the existing economic systems. I think something like Sweden with the socialistic capitalism is something that you would see as more doable than what we have right now. Swedes, the Germans, there, there are a lot of, there, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't personally believe in a utopia and I'm not fighting for a utopia. Good. <laughs> it, it doesn't exist, right? Like we've been chasing it as a, as a race, as a species for however long we've been around. Um, I'm just looking to make things as okay as we possibly can. In the past, you've been criticized for uh, property damage. Uh, you had this interview with uh, one of the other podcasters, um, and you were debating uh, whether or not the property damage uh, was is, is actually um, inexcusable. Uh, so I want to ask you, does do you think that property damage or even physical violence justifies the end? And actually, do you see property damage as as violence even um so first of all no i don't see property damage as violence i've always been very selective in what i choose to attack i don't attack mom and pop stores i don't attack small businesses those are those are people in the community right those are people that have a stake in my community do i believe that violence justifies the means, um, yes, so long as it's defensive violence, right? Violence is a tool. It's just like fire. It can be harmful. It can be good. Fire can burn a house, burn people down, or it can cook our food, right? Um, if people that want to harm marginalized people come to my community, I believe punching them in the face is perfectly okay. You do what you have to do to make them leave your community and keep your community safe. Okay, okay. Uh, what are some of the... Um, what are some of the... And I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but I'm interested. What are some of the things that 
that you've done? I suppose like looting major supermarket chains or what are the like the usual activities? Well, that's an assumption. No, I've never looted anything. Um, I'm not just like I like like me myself. I have never ever looted anything. What are some of the things I've done? I've punched Nazis in the face. Um, I've marched in the streets. I've gotten beaten up by police officers. Um, yeah. Like, like my house, I, I mean, I mentioned it in my book. My house was firebombed in 2018, right? Like people were so against my talking about human rights that they decided to wake me up in the middle of the night by trying to firebomb my house in the United States. You guys in the U.S. have a debt that has grown to one trillion in the past three months, while your economy only grew by 5.5 trillion in the past three years. How's that one for you? I can offer you a degree of safety against inflation. You can now be less miserable about the prices, which seem to always rise more than expected as the inflation just won't go away. Look, the government isn't going to take care of you, so forget the protests and do it yourself. Take matters into your own hands is what successful people do. I decided to help my audience shelter their assets and diversify them into gold, which is something that has always been used by the rich to preserve wealth throughout the history. Birch Gold Group makes the process straightforward. They can help you convert your existing IRA or a 401k account into a tax advantage physical gold IRA without any of the out-pocket costs. Just text Captain East to 989898 and receive their free info kit on gold IRAs that is packed with insider information on how gold and silver can protect your savings. I've checked out their references before partnering with them, and their endorsements include Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, and Ron Paul, and I trust these people. With an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, Gold now has five-star reviews and thousands of happy customers. Birch Gold Group is the nation's number one gold IRA provider. To learn more, text Captain East to 989898 and claim your free info kit on gold IRAs. You also have the link in the description below. This is going to be a weird question, maybe, but do you see peaceful protests and asking for change through institutions and through the mainstream ways as degrading in a way? Since we as citizens have the power to take it to the streets and induce greater measures, so to speak. Or do you see that just as futile to do that? Okay. So you live in Slovenia, right? This podcast is in Slovenia. So I'm not sure of your laws there or anything. Here in the United States, we have the Constitution. And our Constitution says that we have the right to assemble. Right? So that means that I don't have to ask a government that I am trying to protest against permission to assemble, right? Asking for permission to me is kind of like the Jewish people asking the Nazi regime to protest. Doesn't really make sense. Um, It's not degrading. It, 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 it's not degrading. It doesn't harm me. It's that I don't have to, right? It, 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 it doesn't harm me to ask, but I don't have to ask. So why are you trying to make me ask? Does that make sense? Like here in the same here in the United States, we have certain rights, okay, and and we say that these rights are inalienable, which means that they cannot be taken away from us, no matter what. One of those is the freedom to assemble. Now my government is wants to say, oh, that's we were wrong. We had this thing for 200 years and now we were wrong. No, I'm not going to ask for freedom to assemble. I'm going to go into the streets whenever I feel the need to go into the streets. Let's say you have people who also identify themselves as uh, Antifa, but instead they go to the, to the streets even though it's not really excusable because someone wasn't threatened and they believe they were, if you know what I mean. What are the checks and balances here? What I guess what I'm trying to say is, what is the criteria or like the 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 moral judgment? Um, it, it, I mean, is it up to each individuals if they feel threatened that they can go to the streets, or who should be not policing, but who should be? I guess who should 
hold like the moral judgment. Sometimes I feel disrespected or threatened, but um, <laughs> no, I don't. But let's say I do, <laughs> and uh, my impulse would be <laughs> my impulse would be to punch someone in the face. But you know, but maybe my judgment may be off. I hear you. So um, first of all, I gotta tell you, you remind me of my sister. My sisters are German, and so my sisters are all blonde hair and blue eyed, and, and we we joke because my sister Vanessa, we call her Russian or Eastern European, right? Like so, because when she speaks English, she sounds just like you. Okay, that that aside though, it's it's early here. Like I said, it's um, what time is it? Oh, it's not even eight. O'clock. And when I speak German, I need I you know I'm Aryan, so speaking German is like I I want to sound especially gentle when I do it. <laughs> so, but yeah, in, in in answer to your question, it is kind of an individual moral thing there there is no quote-unquote leadership that's ridiculous um for example i don't know if you've been following our election but there are people that have been since the the election night protesting the election um i don't um i believe that the election was excuse me was fair so why am i gonna go protest something that i that I didn't, I mean, I wasn't a Kamala Harris fan, but, like, I don't go protest a football match when Bayern Munich wins, right? Like, so I'm not going to go protest an election. Now, we'll see what happens come January when this man takes office and what happens from there. So, yes, it is an individual thing. People, and people have the right and the responsibility to control yourself and to be responsible for your actions you so you said that uh there's no like hierarchical high hierarchical fuck it hierarchical structure in uh antifa so i assume it's made up of like multiple anonymous groups and individuals does it have like a so it doesn't have a chain of command how do you share far right activities across regional and national borders how how do you exchange information i mean how do you exchange information right like um, with people across borders we, like people talk i mean i don't you, you know i mean i don't know what people do um i i myself i am concerned with fascists and racists in my area right which is the northwest of portland means that like this is where I'm from this is where I fight for so I'm not trying to tell people in Slovenia or anti-fascists in Slovenia how to live what to think or how to go about it anti-fascists in Slovenia figure that figure that out for themselves right and as far as your question goes fascist people Authoritarian people, they like to make their movements known. They like to make their like they like to let you know where they are in the world. They like they they're really look at me people. Right? So it's not hard to find them. Do you think you function in some ways like a private investigator for far right activities? Um, and, and uh, by the way, uh, before you answer, in Slovenia, actually, we do have an Antifa group, uh, and uh, it's mostly nonviolent. I don't think it, yeah, it's mostly nonviolent. It, it's more about, let's say, telling people they have a Nazi living across the street, or telling employees that employers that they're about to employ a neo-Nazi, hoping to get them not hired or fired, for example. Uh, so those are the most common activities of Antifa in my country. That's called doxing, and yeah, like so. Right, so so that is that is a part of it. There are people that do that. There are people that fight in the streets. There are people that you you know. Um, the funny thing about being an anti-fascist activist is that ninety percent, about ninety percent of your work, no one ever hears about and no one really cares about, right? Because it's not the sexy violence that people care about, right? Like fighting in the streets might make up 5% of my my activism historically, right? Most of my activism is spent passing out food, giving out money, talking to people, helping people find resources for mental health, 
clothing, education. That's what anti-fascists are out doing in the streets, right? It's not really about fighting. Like fighting is, you know, fighting is fighting. Um, but but that's the stuff that that to make a better world that ninety nine point nine percent of anti fascists are doing in your country, in my country, and everywhere else. I do agree with that actually. Um, and uh, just as far as media reporting goes, you know, Antifa giving out food is not a very catchy headline. Uh, so it kind of gets back to money, you know. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, fascists. Um, how would you define one? If if you had to figure out whether I am a fascist or not, what kind of questions would you ask me? Do you want to control people? No. It's okay for anybody to live any way they want in your neighborhood. As long as they're not hurting anyone, I would say yes. Do you hate people based on the color of their skin or their sexuality? No. Are you okay with trans people living in your neighborhood, marrying who they want to, working where they want to, looking how they want to? But what if sometimes I probably subconsciously judge someone based on their sexuality or race? What if I subconsciously relate to someone who's my race more than someone who's black, let's say? There is nothing wrong, in my opinion, with thinking that something is weird or odd. You can see me. I have face tattoos. I have face piercings. I'm weird. Thinking things are different, that's okay. You cannot stop that person from living their life. Being gay is okay. It's how these people were made. And they have the right to live their life however they see fit, so long as they are not farming anyone. See, I don't believe people like Donald Trump and Elon Musk, I don't believe they're capitalists. Oligarchs, yeah. I believe they're ugly arcs. Capitalism is pro illegal immigration. If people come over illegally, then you don't have to pay them what you have to pay a worker. You don't have to pay them health care. You don't have to pay them as much money as you pay everybody else. So in the end, you're making more money. All these capitalists in America that voted for Donald Trump, they're about to be surprised. It's a, and I think that's actually a good point because on paper, capitalism is pro uh, illegal immigration, but in practicality, capitalism loves it. Where do the roots of your perspective on society and the way you see it come from? I assume you didn't come from Antifa family. How did you, how did you got into um, uh, this line of thinking? I grew up listening to punk music, right? Um, so that na naturally has a leftist bent. Um, as well as I grew up in a district in San Francisco called the Mission District. Um, and my aunties and my uncles were all activists in the 60s with like revolutionary groups like the Brown Berets. And um, the Brown Berets were are, are comparative to like the Black Panthers, but for Latino people. Right. So they, they were a militant political group. So I've kind of just always grown up with it a little bit like activism in my blood and working for the people in my blood, um, so to speak. Right. It was things that my family was talking around about the dinner table and everything like that. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of just kind of a natural thing. Um, and then with the election of America's first fascist president in 2016, I became politically active again. Prior to that, I was writing a comedy TV show with my best friend. You are also um, obviously not very anonymous. Uh, Antifa members usually cover their faces uh, and they use uh, black block techniques where they dress and cover their faces, not only to stay anonymous, but also to kind of I guess it's also to create a sense of equality among participants and from a belief that hierarchies are bad and anonymity can, helps keep someone's ego in check, but it's mostly just because of protection. Uh, why do you use to, Why do you choose to not protect yourself? Uh, why did you decide to be out in the open? And uh, do you receive any threats on a daily basis because you're basically people know who you are? So Black Block started in germany right um it was people that they lived in 
They were illegally living in an apartment building in a block, and they were fighting for their rights to, to, to keep housed. Um, and then somebody discovered, hey, we all dress this way. They, they can't arrest us for breaking their laws. So, yeah, Black Bloc is a tactic, um, but it's a tactic that any group can use, right? So just because you see a group of, of, of people in Black Bloc doesn't mean that they're all anti-fascists, right? There could be some cops in there. There could be some Nazis in there, there right? Like, so that's the thing. There could be some agitators in that crowd. Um, I remain, I, I choose to, I chose not to hide my face because I was talking to a fellow indigenous member of a tribe and we were talking about warriors from our people because he was from a North American indigenous tribe and I'm from a Central American indigenous tribe and that our warriors were brave, right? They didn't have to hide their face. So why would I want to hide my face? I feel like that's disrespectful to everyone that came before me. And and I'm fighting a, I'm fighting a system that is against people that look like me so I want that system to see me. And as far as threats go, yeah. I like in 2020 I was shot at twice, like I said in 2018, my house was firebombed. Um So yeah, it was a, it was a crazy period in my life. Um since then, um things chilled out under the Biden administration. Um but with the election of Trump about a week ago, um, you know, the right wing is feeling comfortable reaching out to me and threatening me and um, all that fun stuff again. So I absolutely, am I scared? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so since the election, the amount of threats to you increased? Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned the police before, uh, and you published a book called anti fascist so a memoir of the Portland Uprising from 2016 to 2020, and it's an insight into what it's like to actively fight fascism in your streets. Um, and in that memoir, you also talk about the police, um, the joy of police when they see violence and how they manipulate vulnerable members of community into giving them information. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that. What's uh, what tactics does the police the uh, the police employ? My city's police union is the strongest police union and the oldest police union in in this country. Our police, the Portland Police Department, have a history of violence and there is a really good podcast by a gentleman named robert evans called behind the police where they where they talk about you know portland police doing cocaine and then going out in the streets and beating people and things like that um we're able to see so the, the the police at at actions they like to send what they call their liaisons officers which is that they're looking for leaders of actions to hold them accountable and 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 you know to 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 try and get information uh one action here they approached a person named june davies and opened up a line of communication with this human being who then proceeded to give the police information over the course of several months. One night after a protest, this person got drunk with their affinity group, and affinity groups are the people that you protest with, and had told them what they had done, that they had given the police information, and they turned over the text to their affinity group. Their affinity group came to me, not knowing what to do, and we made the text public. So they're in my book, and you can read them, and you can see how the police manipulate people to get you to flip information, like telling you that one day you're going to be their boss, that you're such a great you know, person by putting your friends in danger. 
Uh, what percentage of police would you say are actually doing the good work and have good intentions? Zero. Zero. Do 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 you believe um, we should have the police at all? Because if something bad happens, you probably want to call someone. I don't call the police. Um, do you need a system in place to keep the community safe? Yes, you do. Does it need to be police? No, by by the very word policing, it means that you are looking at fellow citizens as criminals. You 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 you're you're looking at them as less than. And so do we need the police? No, here and here in the states policing came from two places. In the south, it came from policing people, right? What we call sheriffs have a di- are direct descendants from slave hunters. And in the North, policing came from property defense. So we don't have a system that's here that's really designed to protect people. We have a system that's designed here in the United States to accuse people, right? And there are many things that you can do to make a system of community safety. For example, here in the States, police officers don't carry insurance. A plumber has to carry insurance, right? Here in the States, if you take away qualified immunity, here, a police officer shoots. Okay, say you and I were out and about, right? And we see a police shooting. That police officer who just shot that person can go home. You and I, as witnesses, we have to stay there for however long we have to stay there until they say we can go home. But the person who just shot somebody can go home. Our police officers should be should have degrees. Here in Portland, you can have a GED, which is a general education diploma, and be 18. Nothing against 18-year-olds and a general education diploma, but that's not really the person who I want to trust with my laws. So so you're not necessarily against having police per se, but against having this type of policing system that we have at the moment, where basically the the entry bar is too low. I mean, yeah, I, I, I also don't believe that... I, I, I'm an abolitionist, so I don't believe in jail for 90% of the crimes. I think, you know... Sex abusers and murderers should be in prison. I don't think drug addicts should be in prison. I think that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I, I actually, I agree. Um, in this memoir, what do people get wrong that you try to show with this memoir? What, like, what are like the most common misconceptions about uh, Antifa? Anti-fascists aren't all communists. Anti-fascists are normal everyday people with children with families anti-fascism isn't about this wealthy weird elite it's it, it's a it's for everyone it's for the benefit of everyone right um andy know who a lot of people know and who is considered by the right wing an expert on Antifa who testified before Congress who got something like a quarter of a million dollars for being punched in the head and and sued what he considered members of Antifa like lost and he tells lies and the right wing like just swallows him. I am literally mentioned in the first page of his book the third paragraph, right? And what he writes didn't happen, right? Like, so he, because he writes about the day, he opens his book with the story of the day that he got attacked and that him and I made eye contact and that he soldiered on past me. That didn't happen. I didn't even see him that day, right? Um, I didn't even find out until after the attack, what had happened when I saw a bunch of people running down the street. And I was like, what's going on? And someone told me. And I laughed. 
So there are a lot of misconceptions about what it is to be anti-fascist. And the people in the streets, they're anti-fascist. But I absolutely promise you, there are a lot of people that you don't know are anti-fascist. And, and that's how it should be, right? There are a lot of people that are doctors, lawyers, professionals that support freedom. Yeah, it's just that they're not active enough um, to be in the media. Um, when was the last time you did this thing that you labeled the doxing? I think you said it's called doxing. Uh, what, what are some activities that you did as it regards to doxing? I don't dox. That's not my skill set. Okay. What? Well, what do you do? What's your um, What's your main way of um, fighting for your cause? I fight fascism. In like in what way? I don't like when fascists come to my town. I fight fascism in so many different ways. Um, so I I I feed people. Um, we're get, I'm getting ready to pass out a bunch of food come Christmas time. I've given money away that my book is made. So we've paid for people's schools. We've paid for people to keep their lights on, people to keep their gas on. We've bought people food, paid for people's gas. Um, I've done, I've talked to people. I've helped people find therapy. I've paid for people's therapy. I have, and you know, I also do things that, you know, what people really want to hear. I also fight Nazis. Um, you know, I, I will fight a fascist in the street. You know, if a fascist wants, if a fascist wants to get down, we can get down. You know, I have a hanging clansman on my arm for a reason. What, uh, what does that mean? I'm blonde, so it takes a while. Well, yeah. So it's a clansman and the Ku Klux Klan is a sign of hate here in America, hanging on a tree with the words, the initials FWP which stands for fuck white power. I assume most of the things that you do are not violent. As you said, you give out food a lot. Um, people don't like talking about it because it's not sexy, but, you know, what part of it is actually violence or property damaging? I mean, I haven't been in a fight in a few years. Like, right? Like, I haven't, like, I mean, I live in a fascist-free neighborhood, right? And I, and I live in a fascist-free community on top of that. I'm not out chasing fascists from town to town. I'm out to keep them out of my town, out of my community, to keep my community safe. So as long as they don't come here, we're good. Uh, you also had a conversation with a member of Proud Boys, uh, as we talked about before we started this podcast, um, who I'm also trying to get on this podcast in the in near future. Is, is he in jail or is he free? Do you have any information? I have, like, that dude's a hobo. Um, I have no, I have no, I, okay. Well, I mean, cause you never know, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, when yeah. You get into no, these I, have, I, I have no idea. I do know that after that interview that, um, the prod boys were really embarrassed by him and he had a really hard time. Oh, okay. I, I didn't know that. Okay. So, uh, now just for the audience, the Proud Boys is a group that combines, uh, Trumpian capitalism, which means glorify the entrepreneur and close the border completely, uh, radical libertarianism. So give everyone a gun and, and welfare and traditional gender roles. So, uh, venerate the housewife. Um, now the group is only open to biological men. And in order to be accepted into the first level, uh, you have to recite, I am a Western chauvinist, um, and I refuse to apologize for creating the modern world. Then you have the second level that involves getting hit by a fellow member, and then the third level is where you receive a tattoo. So uh, it's no joke, this group. There, there are four levels of being a proud boy. What's the four? Um, the fourth is that you have to engage in violence and see um, and have a member of the proud boys um see you engage in violence, whether you attack a member of the state or whether you attack a member of a, an anti-fascist. Um, we did have a mole within the Proud Boys. Proud Boys here in the Northwest fill out applications. And so we were given the applications of said Proud Boys. And in my book, I publish all their, all their applications. And so you can see the things that they do to 
Like one of them, I believe, attacked a police officer. One of them was a member of ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is a government job. Um, so you can see where they are in society. Okay, I see. Okay. Uh, now, Rob, uh, I think he was on the third level at that time. Uh, what made you decide to talk to him? Because you actually sat down and had a something that was kind of like a decent-ish conversation that one could hope for in these circumstances? Um, I was asked by the BBC if I would sit down for this interview, and I agreed. So I sat down. Mm -hmm. You had no expectations. You just wanted to present your point and see where he's coming from, maybe. I didn't know it was Rob, um, but I know who he is. Like, we had seen each other in the streets. Did I have any expectations of, like, converting him? No. Well, I mean, converting him would be very ambitious, but <laughs> maybe, like, learning something. If you saw Rob on the street, would you interact at all? Do you think he would get into an argument? Would you try to, like, pass by? I mean, if I saw Rob on the streets and he was walking on the streets, I've got nothing to say to that dude. I've got, like, I don't, I don't give a shit about him. If I saw Rob on the streets harassing and harming people, would I stop and say something and do something? Absolutely. Yeah, so it would be more re reactionary. Um, you talked about Trump before. Uh, now, with Trump being president, how do you see the future for the United States in the upcoming years? Do you have way less hope uh, for freedom than you had before? I think that my country is entering the dark times. Um, you, you know, I think we're going to see families deported. I think we're going to see the trans community that's already scared, you know, put in more harm's way. I think things are going, I think we're going to go backwards in this country. Do you think it's Trump per se or people who are misguided? Do you think he's like a gatekeeper? You know what I mean? And not himself the problem? Because I, I, I understand, you know, actually, I uh, Trump did learn a lot from Hitler. I I, I, I do th believe that's the truth. Uh, Make America Great Again slogan is a fascist slogan, not in a way, not, not literally, but he took some lessons from how to use propaganda in order to um, uh, gain support by, by citizens. Um, but don't you think that labeling Trump as a person, as the whole reason, as a fascist is a little bit beyond reason? Do, do, do you think it's more like he's just trying to be in that position and then people see him as like a gateway and, and, uh, and uh, like, like a gatekeeper to now start doing their little irrational activities like neo-Nazis, for example. Trump is a racist and a fascist. He has said that he would be a fascist on day one. When did he say that? When I believe it was an interview with Sean Hannity. What do you think? How do you think America would look like um, 10 years down the road if we take the bad path <laughs> and uh, basically continue where you said that we are headed? I think we'll be in a civil war. I'm not going backwards, and I know a lot of other people aren't going backwards. Something's got to give. I'm scared because I know this dude, Trump, thinks that I'm the one of the enemies within. He sent federal troops to my city. We battled those motherfuckers for 100 days. He did label Antifa as terrorist organization. I remember that. He said that, yeah. Mm -hmm. He called my town the, the anarchist jurisdiction. We took over an ICE facility here that went across country. That movement went across the country. I think it's going to be a scary time. I think people are going to have to fight the system however you can. From and, and, I, and I don't think that that means necessarily fighting in the streets, right? Like, I am, I, I, I'm not designed to fight the best equipped the best trained, most brutal military force in human history. I'm not, I'm not designed to do that. I am designed to fight it from the backside, though, right? And when we look at groups that have fought our military successful, successfully and won, they are protracted, long, horrific, brutal engagements. Look at, like, the Afghan people, like the Vietnamese people, right? 
these were long engagements. And I think that's what we here in the United States have to be prepared for. Although more than 50% of people in the United States voted for Trump, uh, do you think these people are misinformed? Yes. Okay, just one last question, because I, I, I've kept you hostage for about an hour. Uh, actually, that's that's not a very good expression, helped you hostage for about an hour, Jesus. Uh, as far as people who label themselves as members of Antifa, what are some of the flaws you see in some of them? What are they doing wrong that's maybe even against your perspective? And I'm saying, like, maybe especially the youth that um, enters some side, that, that comes into some sort of ideology and decides to just fight for the sake of violence. Do you see that happening at all? I, I, I think that there are a lot of political ideologies that float around in the world that sound good but are really horrific. I think it's up to the individual to study. Excuse me. We hear a, a, a system in North Korea, Gucci. It sounds great, right? Like self-reliance. That's awesome. Depending on ourselves, doing it ourselves. And then you dig, but you have to dig a little deeper, right? That sounds good on, the, on top. But then you're like, oh, people can't move. People can't have the jobs that they want. There's their gulags, their fucking prison camps. There's all these things that go to a society. And if you have to have these things to keep your society in order, then it's ridiculous, right? As an anti-fascist, I don't want a country whose political thought is in line with me. Where's the fun in that, right? That's everybody looking the same. That's every, like, you can go ahead and be a right winger. You can go ahead and be conservative. Nothing stops people from being a dick, right? But what you cannot be is you cannot be racist. You cannot be homophobic and you cannot be transphobic, right? You cannot stop people from living their lives, doesn't mean that we all got to be the same. It means that, you know, you can hold on to your views. If you, if you want to believe in some ridiculous God and it helps you in your life, who am I to stop you? Right? So, like, to answer your question, it's not really up from to me to tell people you're doing this wrong or you're doing that wrong because we all have a different path, right? And we're all growing, especially kids, right? They're all growing. They're all changing. Um, I have a 14-year-old child who is much different at 14 than they were at 10, right? Who will be much different at 16 and at 17 and 18, right? Because they're changing. Here, let me, let me hit you with a little secret that the right wing of they here will probably laugh at. Every time I have had to use violence, every time, I go around the corner and I cry for like 45 minutes. I hate violence, right? It's like, I'm pretty mm -hmm. good at it, but I don't like it, right? And I don't like to, because I, I, don't, I, I don't like to hurt people. I've been beat up. Why do I want to beat up somebody else, even if they're a right winger? That's, that's like, right? But if you're there to harm people, then I got to do whatever I got to do to make you stop hurt, hurting people. And even words can hurt. Words can be more violent than actually getting punched. Like, I've been called things that still to this day still fuck with my head. And I still think about, I don't think about every time I got punched. Hitler himself didn't burn millions of Jews. It's his words that did it, right? How does your everyday day look like, day in life now? I, like I said, I've been, you know, selling my books. So some days I give interviews, some days more than other days. Um, you know, do, you know, watch the news, watch sports. I'm a big football fan. Um, and not like European football, but American football. I think that's going to change real soon here. I, I, I think that um, as this man gains power and as we see... Like, I mean, he just appointed a fucking Fox News host as Secretary of Defense. 
So I think my life is going to get really interesting. I think we're going to see horrific images on the border. And I think what's worst is that this country is going to be okay with that. What, uh, uh, in, what, in what particular way do you see a change? You mean like going on protests on a daily basis? I, I, I will fight this system any way that I can. I see myself doing something. I don't know what. Like I want, but the thing is, I want to be useful. I don't do this because I like it. Like I said, I have a child. I want to do things like I like scooters. I like motorcycles. I want to ride those with my boys. I want to have fun. I want to go to shows, right? I don't want to get shot at. I don't. I don't want to live in fear of like the state and and going to jail. You see it as a moral obligation on your part to um Yeah. Absolutely. We we have a we have a race problem and and a problem in this country and we've had it since the Civil War and it never got fixed and it is just continued. Uh, are you uh, uh, are you afraid of well you have a 14 year old daughter in, in in what way do you think she's in danger like when she's at school i mean she's i mean she's obviously not a public figure but <laughs> if you saw your father go to jail for for defending human rights wouldn't it kind of mess with your head it would make me question the system yes so i worry about these things for for them like like every other activist you know if something like that were to happen to me, were I to die, to get hurt, or to get arrested, I could only hope that my daughter understood and understands why. Well, look, man, uh, that was an amazing conversation. I'm not trying to shift anyone's perspective, but I wanna—I really wanted to talk to you because I think it's a great insight. And um, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, it was Keep great. It. Where can people find you? Not like physically, but, you know, books and stuff. I'm in Portland, Oregon. So everybody knows where I'm at. Like, it, it's no secret anyway. So you can find me at Luis the Leftist X and Luis the Leftist on Insta. Um, I believe I have a website, antifascistmemoir.com. And your book is on Amazon, right? Oh, yeah. You can find my book on it. Yeah. Anywhere you can get books or order books, you can order my book. Um, Please do. And just remember that a portion of all sales goes to help the people. Right. Um, Whether it's feeding them, clothing them. I'm not interested in promoting anything other than like freedom and people having what they need. You're really smoking a joint. Can I, when I'm in Portland, can we smoke a joint? Actually, it's been a while since I've smoked one. Actually, you can't. Um, these are, each one is a gram and um, it's like liquid marijuana. Like, like, so the essence of marijuana, it's got like a little switch on it. So you can go to the left or the right or do both of them. And then you push the little button and. Fuck yeah. Well, that's how I demonetize a video. Well, see, like every morning I wake up and I smoke pot and I drink a cup of hot chocolate. Yeah, in in uh, in a month or two or a couple of months, if you're still alive, I would like to do a part two. Uh, I'm going to, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have a, I'm actually going to have one of those member of Proud Boys on my podcast. I, I want to hear their insight. I want to see what, what they're up to. I'm always willing to talk with them too if you want to do something. I, I, I'm, I'm happy to get in all type of trouble. So I'm down. <laughs> I, I like to show the differences between us. Like, awesome, man. All right. Well, thank that, you so much for coming this. on this podcast. Yep, yep.